good evening, everyone, um, and very and thank you very much for um, uh, joining this talk. I'm thrilled to be presenting my third talk for Kaki. Uh, the previous two being on um, uh, the Nizam of Hyderabad and also on Indian magic. So it's uh, covered a fair bit of ground. This one, as uh, Amrita mentioned, is on the princely states. Um, Amrita, you've you've uh, borrowed a bit from my introduction. I'll go over it again in your introduction. So uh, uh, apologies for those people um, who might have heard this already. Um, India's princes, they they lived in fairy tale palaces. They amassed untold fortunes in diamonds and precious stones, maintained fleets of Rolls Royces and traveled in specially appointed train carriages, arriving in the capital Delhi to the sound of thunderous gun salutes. They had the power of life and death over their subjects and thousands of minions attended to their every need. As you can see, on the eve of independence in 1947, India's 562 princely states occupied nearly half the landmass of the subcontinent and ruled over a third of its population. They were Britain's most loyal allies and they were virtually untouchable. Only those who committed the most heinous of crimes were censured or in the rarest of cases removed. Um, but in the end game of empire, they saw their kingdoms swept from under their feet. And three quarters of a century later, all but the richest and most politically active live ordinary and mundane lives. Scholarship on the princely states has always been eclipsed by narratives on the nationalist struggle. India's princes have generally been portrayed as debauched, despotic, and decadent, a one-size-fits-all categorization that embraces principalities the size of an average London park to giants such as Hyderabad. Following independence, V.P. Menon's book, The Story of the Integration of the Indian States, became the accepted narrative, coming as it did from the bureaucrat who, let, who dealt directly with the princes. So the next slide is uh, Mountbatten and Edwina. Um, and you've got the text, so you should be able to follow it. When Lord Louis Mountbatten became the last viceroy, the princes thought their savior had arrived. Surely an aristocrat like him would not throw them to the nationalist wolves. Mountbatten, however, had only limited understanding of the subcontinent and left the problem of the princely states too late. So when, when Mountbatten became the vice where the princes thought their savior had arrived, surely an aristocrat like him would throw them to the nationalist wolves. However, Mountbatten had only limited understanding of the subcontinent and left the problem of the princely states too late. He also sent out contradictory messages, insisting on the one hand that Britain would never tear up its treaties with the states or compel them to join India or Pakistan, while at the same time getting behind the going behind the back of the India office officials in London and doing everything he could to bring the princes to heel. Uh, next slide on Nehru. The nationalists were never big fans of the princes. Jawaharlal Nehru could not stomach the existence of what he described as sinks of reaction and incompetence and unrestrained autocratic power, sometimes exercised by vicious and degraded individuals. Had Nehru been put in charge of the State's Department when it had been formed in late June 1947, his visceral hatred of the princes would have sabotaged any hope of seeing a majority accede to India. Next slide. Vallabhai Patel, the Congress Party's leader and the man who as State's Minister would ultimately deal with the princes, was less visceral in his reactions, but adamant that if India was to be territorially and politically viable, the princely states had to be part of it. Any deviation from this goal would risk plunging a dagger into the very heart of India. Unlike Nehru, he employed a more diplomatic and pragmatic approach, cultivating close links with rulers of influential states such as Patiala and Gwalior, and appealing to the prince's proud and glorious past. Today, Patel is often called the Bismarck of India, for repeating the German Chancellor's feast of cajoling a group of scattered and disparate princedoms into giving up their sovereignty and creating a cohesive nation state. In reality, as his biographer D.V. Talmanka notes, 
the task in India was infinitely more difficult and complex than Bismarck's, with not dozens but hundreds of potentates reluctant to give up ancestral estates, great privileges, and ruling powers. Next slide, please. The feat was not Patel's alone. In fact, the real architect of, of the accession and integration of the states was Vapalal Panguni Menon. Over a remarkable three decade long career, VP Menon had gone from being a coolie in the mines of the Kolar goldfields to being promoted to the highest position in the government ever held by an Indian, serving as reforms commissioner and constitution constitutional advisor to three viceroys, Lord Linlithgow, Lord Wavell, and now Mountbatten. In the weeks and months preceding independence on August the 15th, 1947, Patel's powerful personality, which mixed fury with charm and persuasion with coercion, would complement Menon's skill as a tactician. In theory, the princes could choose between acceding to India or Pakistan or declaring their independence once the treaties that bound them to the British crown lapsed on the transfer of power. But faced with the combined juggernaut of Mountbatten, Patel and Menon, they found the space shrinking around them. Accede to India, they were told, and your internal affairs will be untouched. Refuse and risk being overthrown by your subjects without anyone coming to your aid. The strategy worked with all but a handful of states joining the Indian Union when their ally and protector, Britain, left for good. The urgency with which the states were being dealt with stemmed from the very real fear that while an India deprived of its eastern and western wings because of partition would survive, an India deprived of its states would lose all coherence. In an influential essay published in 1944, the constitutional expert Reginald Coupland wrote, and I quote, and you've got the quote there, the states form a great cruciform barrier separating all four quarters of the country. If no more than the central Indian states and Hyderabad and Mysore were excluded from the Union, the United Provinces would almost be completely cut off from Bombay and Bombay completely from Sindh. The strategic and economic implications are obvious enough. The practicability of Pakistan must be admitted, but the more the separation of the states from British India is considered, the more impractical it seems. India could live if its Muslim limbs in the Northwest and Northeast were amputated, but could it live without its heart? While the origins of kingship in India date back more than three millennia to the early Vedic period, most of the princely states at the time of independence owed their existence to the slow collapse of the Mughal Empire following the death of Aurangzeb in 1707. Centuries of foreign domination meant that many of the rulers who carved out their own states were outsiders. The Nizams of Hyderabad were of Turkoman stock. Bhopal was established by one of Aurangzeb's Afghan generals. Rampur's first ruler was a Pashtun, only the Rajput states and a scattering of South Indian kingdoms could trace their lineages to the pre-Mughal period. The Muslim potentates of Hyderabad and Junagadh ruled over majority Hindu populations. The situation was reversed in Kashmir. Most of the subjects of Kaputala's Sikh Maharaja were Muslims. States such as Udaipur and Rewa were bastions of conservatism. When Lord Minto attended a state banquet in his honor at the Lake Palace, Fateh Singh's mania for ritual purity meant he dined separately. He is held in the deepest reverence and when any of his subjects speak to him, a towel is held over the mouth in order that the Maharana should not be desecrated by their breath, Lady Minto noted. Rewa's Gulab Singh refused to allow a railway line to pass through his state after his Brahmin advisers warned that beef might be on the menu in restaurant cars. Mysore's long-serving ruler Krishna Raja Wadia was another devout Hindu who for many years refused to leave India because to cross the ocean would mean a loss of caste. But he was also a visionary whose achievements included the setting up of a hydroelectric power plant, a steel mill, an eye hospital, the Indian Institute of Science and the State Bank of Mysore. His successor, Jaya Chama Rajendra Wadia, was a trained classical musician who was equally at ease with a Carnatic Kriti 
and a Chopin sonata. Following independence, he provided funds to London's Philharmonic Orchestra to help pay the salary of the conductor, Herbert von Karajan. The largest state was Kashmir, with an area of 218,799 square kilometers, followed closely by Hyderabad. Located in, in the Deccan, Hyderabad's income and expenditure rivaled that of Belgium, and in 1947 was larger than that of 20 members of the UN. At the other end of the scale were more than 300 microstates. The bulk of, were in the peninsula of Katiawa, where numerous individual fiefdoms were not much bigger than a couple of cricket pitches. Maharaja Ganga Singh of Bikaneer once remarked that he knew of a Katiawa state with an income of 43 rupees and whose kingdom is a well. In exchange for the guaranteed for guaranteed protection against internal unrest or attacks by his enemy, a ruler would have to accept a British resident or political agent at his court, and in the case of larger states, pay for a military force commanded by British officers. About 40 states had actual uh, treaties with Britain. Hyderabad's committed Britain to maintain 5,000 troops for the protection of the state, while Bhopal spoke of perpetual friendship. Another hundred or so had signed sanards or agreements with, that acknowledged the authority of the paramount power, while the remainder enjoyed some form of recognition of their status by the crown. To constitute the princes into a feudal hierarchy, the British devised a system of gun salutes ranging from 21 down to nine. Out of 562 states, 149 had gun salutes. In determining a state's ranking, size and population offered, often mattered less than loyalty and lineage. Only five states enjoyed 21-gun status, Hyderabad, Kashmir, Mysore, Gwalior, and Baroda. But even they were a long way down the imperial pecking order. The King Emperor was entitled to a 101-gun salute and the Viceroy to 31. Before taking up his viceroyalty, Mountbatten was summoned by King George VI to Buckingham Palace. The British monarch was worried about the position of the states in the coming negotiations over India's independence. Do what you can to see fair play for the princes, he urged his cousin. It was an, in, it was an instruction Mountbatten would interpret very loosely. On the 13th of June, 1947, 10 days after announcing that India would be partitioned and the date for independence brought forward to June 19, from June 1948 to August 1947, he finally convened a meeting of all relevant parties to consider the issue of the princely states. Present at the conclave were Nehru, Patel, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and a clutch of senior officials. The main item on on the order of business was the establishment of a state's department as soon as possible. On the 27th of June, 1947, the department was set up, comprising an Indian section headed by Sardar Patel and a Pakistan section headed by Muslim League stalwart, Abdul Rab Nishtar. Patel chose as his, as his deputy, VP Menon. The problem of what to do about the states was finally being addressed, but it seemed like a case of too little too late. In early June, Bhopal's Nawab Hamidullah Khan had declared his state would become independent following the transfer of power. Just two days earlier, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, a week later, Osman Ali Khan had issued a farman de declaring that Hyderabad would not accede to either of the newly announced dominions and that he would resume the status of an independent sovereign. On the same day, C.P. Ramaswamy Ayer made a similar declaration to Travancore's legislature. Two of India's most important and strategic states had now joined Bhopal in declaring their intention to go it alone. Kashmir was equivocating. As Patel later recalled, quote, the situation was indeed fraught with immeasurable potentialities for disruption. Menon's first priority was to draft an instrument of accession based on three subjects, defence, external affairs and communications. His reasoning was that defence was not a matter that could be conducted by the states themselves. External affairs was linked to defence and communications were by nature a federal concern. 
a standstill agreement to maintain existing arrangements for customs, currency, postal services, and similar matters um, <clears throat> until the transfer of power was also drafted. It was a transparent two-step process that might just be enough to bring the princes to the party. They would be reminded that two out of the three, three functions they were surrendering had not been theirs earlier as responsibility for defense and foreign affairs had rested with the crown. They were reassured that there would be no interference in their internal political structures. On the 11th of June, Menon and Patel drew up the agenda for the Conference of Rulers and Representatives of Indian States in the Chamber of Princes. It was to be held on the 25th of July. The conference would mark the first and last time Mountbatten addressed the chamber. If there was anything resembling a consensus among the princes as they waited for Mountbatten to begin his speech, it was their view that as a blue-blooded royal with a passion for polo and pig sticking, he would prove an ally when they needed one the most. He knew many of the princes personally, counting among his close friends the Maharajas of Bikaneer and Jaipur and the Nawab of Bhopal. Using every weapon in his oratorical armory, Mountbatten told the princes he was about to present them with a take it or leave it offer, which would not be repeated. They would be given instruments to sign, which provided a session on defense, foreign affairs and communications. There would be no financial li liability on the part of the states, nor would the central government have any power to encroach on their internal autonomy or sovereignty. It was a bargain so advantageous, Mountbatten assured them, he wasn't even sure the Indian government would accept it. Quote, my scheme leaves you with all the practical independence you can possibly use and makes you free of all those subjects which you cannot possibly manage on your own. The core message from the speech and one that made the headlines in Indian newspapers the following day was, you cannot run away from the Dominion government, which is your neighbor, any more than you can run away from subjects for whose welfare you are responsible. Playing to their love of titles, Mountbatten told the assembled monarchs that if they signed on the dotted line, there was every likelihood that Patel and Congress would not interfere with their receiving honors from the king. Not all the princes were convinced by his assurances. Just a week earlier, the Indian Independence Act had received royal assent. It provided for the handover of power to two new dominions on the 15th of August. All treaties with the British Crown would lapse, technically leaving the princes free to either join India or Pakistan, or if they choose, to declare themselves independent. Among the princes, the imminent departure of the Raj evoked a range of emotions. A handful had accepted the necessity of preparing for India's for what India's independence would bring. Many palpably dreaded and resented what they saw as their future once Britain's political and military protection was withdrawn. Despite the provisions of the Independence Act, they would, they feared, be absorbed into the new India against their will. Their autocratic powers and privileges would be washed away, their palaces and treasuries seized, their right to impose customs duties and earn royalties on their mineral wealth wrested from them and their personal fortunes taxed. They could keep their Rolls Royces and royal stables, but these would be empty symbols of lost prestige. As the princes equivocated, the leader of the Muslim League, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, was busy wooing future border states such as Jodhpur, as well as Sikh princes, thrusting blank sheets of paper in front of them and promising to agree to any terms for a session to a future Pakistan they demanded. The state most vulnerable to his advances was Jodhpur. It had joined the Constituent Assembly in April 1947, and Maharaja Umed Singh had been adamant that Jodhpur's future lay with the Indian Union, but his sudden death two months later saw power shift to his son, Hanwant Singh. Young, inexperienced, corpulent and headstrong, the new ruler's passions included flying, British brides, dancing girls and conjuring, the latter a hobby that he took seriously enough to see him eventually elected as a member of the prestigious Magic Circle in London. On coming to the Gadi, Hanwant first announced that his state would remain in the Constituent Assembly, but in early August 1947, Jodhpur's Prime Minister wrote to Mountbatten that Hanwant had decided to seek independence. 
This occurred after a meeting with Jinnah, which, also, which was also attended by Bhopal's Nawab, Hamidullah Khan. Jinnah got straight to the point, offering Hanwant the use of Karachi as a free port, free import of arms, jurisdiction over the Jodhpur Hyderabad Sindh Railway, and a supply of grain to the kingdom's famine threatened district on the condition that Jodhpur would declare its independence on the 15th of August and then join Pakistan. As soon as word of the meeting leaked out, Patel went to work to change the Maharaja's mind. Your Highness is free to stay out if you like, he told Hanwant, but if there is trouble in your state as a result of your decision, you will not get the slightest support from the government of India. Patel ended the conversation by reminding him that the Maharaja's father had left him to his care as a ward. If he did not behave properly, he was obliged to discipline him. Shaken by the warning, he told Patel, quote, well, sir, I have decided to go back to Lord Mountbatten and sign the instrument of accession right now. As far as VP Menon was concerned, however, this was no guarantee that Hanwant would do as directed. When he personally drove Hanwant straight to the Viceroy's office, he was doing so not as a courtesy, but as a foil against further prevarication. Hanwant was directed to Menon, so after signing the instrument of accession in front of Mountbatten, Hanwant was directed to Menon's suite. As Menon would later narrate, Hanwant suddenly whipped out a revolver, leveled it at him and said, I refused to accept your dictation. Menon told Hanwant, he was seriously mistaken if he thought threatening him could get the accession abrogated, adding, don't indulge in juvenile theatricals. The revolver Menon referred to was a seven centimeter long gold-plated pen with a 22 caliber bore made in Hanwant's magic props workshop. When Mountbatten heard of the incident, he made light of it. It became a standing joke between the three men. As a gesture of reconciliation, the Maharaja gifted the pen gun to the Viceroy. Years later, Mountbatten, by then also a member of the Magic Circle, donated it to the Society's Museum. When India finally achieved its independence, it was still fragmented geographically and politically. While several larger princely states were making strides towards representative government, the vast majority were outposts of autocracy too small to introduce effective administrations, too conservative to contemplate democratic reform. Only by a process of integration could India hope to become a functional nation, nation state. But that would require rolling back promises made just a few months earlier not to interfere in the prince's internal affairs. The map of India would have to be withdrawn. Menon and Patel would achieve this through a two-stage process, creating unions of states and merging smaller states with existing provinces. Initially, their focus was only on the smaller states in Orissa and Chhattisgarh, which everybody, aside, for their, aside from their rulers, agreed were not viable. But it would soon embrace even the so-called viable states, such as Jaipur, Bikaneer, Gwalior, Indore, and Baroda, which Menon, Menon promised would remain separate entities. This process was also far from voluntary. When the Raja of Patna wavered about signing an instrument merging his state with the province of Orissa, he was told by Menon that if he refused, his administration would be taken over by force. A few months later, the intelligence bureau began receiving reports that several disaffected rulers from Chhattisgarh were in secret talks with right-wing groups to overthrow the Nehru administration. Other states that objected to merger arrangements included tiny Janjira, south of Bombay, and the much larger and more important state of Kolhapur. They were brought to heel through a mix of inducements ranging from threats of deposition to forcible annexation. When the Indian government published its second white paper on the Indian states in March 1950, it adopted a self-congratulatory tone describing the process of integration as, quote, nothing short of a revolution. Including, included in its pages was a statement by Patel insisting the solution to the state's problem had been offered in the, quote, friendliest disposition with nothing but the ultimate good of the princes and their people at heart. Like the white paper, 
Most narratives of the integration of the princely states praise Patel and Menon for convincing all but three of the princely states that found themselves within the borders of the new dominion to join a united India, namely Junagadh, Hyderabad and Kashmir. The reality was somewhat different. In addition to the states I've already mentioned, namely Hyderabad, Travancore, Kashmir, Bhopal and Jodhpur that either flirted with independence or considered joining the new dominion of Pakistan, there were more than a dozen outliers, notably Dolpur, Indore, Bilaspur, Rampur, Bharatpur, Junagadh, Manavada, Dasuda, Vanod, Jainabad, Bajuna, and Radhanpur. Muslim ruled Radhanpur de delayed signing its instrument of accession for nearly a month after the 15th of August 1947. Piploda in central India would wait until March the following year. In Alwar and Bharatpur, Muslims attempted to join forces with their co-religionists in the Punjab to form an independent Miostan, fueled in part by the lack of sympathy being shown by Congress towards the plight of their inhabitants. The Sikh rulers of states such as Farid Khot and Patiala started devising plans for the formation of an independent Sikhistan. Patel was also vexed by the Rajput states, whose mainly anti-Congress rulers he believed, quote, still dreamt of the power of their swords and still thought of carving out a kingdom for themselves. He would compare the situation facing the government in early 1948 to, quote, a powder magazine, which a single spark may set ablaze. The process of integration would also serve to widen the rift between Nehru and Patel as they clashed over how to respond to threats to India's te territorial integrity thrown up by Junagadh's accession to Pakistan, the tribal invasion of Kashmir and Hyderabad's de declaration of independence, which I'll be discussing shortly. Nehru's reluctance to use force would infuriate Patel, who in turn would be branded a communalist for his insistence on sending the army to dethrone Hyderabad's in his arms. Relations between the two men were tense even before these crises erupted. Some of the worst pre-partition violence uh, had been taking place in Alwar and Bharatpur, whose rulers instituted a pogrom on their Mio Muslim minority. In the first several months of 1947, as many as 30,000 Muslims were killed, up to 20,000 forcibly converted, and an estimated 100,000 forced to flee the two states for the relative safety of the neighboring district of Gurgaon. Whole villages were razed and scores of mosques desecrated by activists belonging to local branches of the RSS and the Hindu Mahasabha. Many of the Muslims who fled these states never returned, preferring to migrate to Pakistan. When in September 1947, Nehru demanded that Patel restrain the rulers of the two states, his request was ignored. When Patel finally did respond, he cautioned against taking action, prompting an infuriated Nehru to send his principal private secretary, HVR Iyengar, to get a first-hand report on the communal situation. When Patel protested, Nehru threatened to resign, accusing his deputy of restricting his freedom. Patel refuted the charge, but then proceeded to countermand the Prime Minister by ordering all Mios to be evacuated to Pakistan. The declaration by Junagadh's reclusive canine-obsessed ruler Mahabat Khan that his state would accede to Pakistan was the first threat to India's unity to emerge in the days after independence. Patel immediately recognised the implications if India accepted Khan's legal right to decide which dominion to join, it would set a precedent for another Muslim prince ruling a Hindu majority state, namely Hyderabad. Not challenging the accession would give Pakistan the right to object to the Hindu ruler of Muslim dominated Kashmir opting for India. To avert such scenarios, Patel insisted that India intervene militarily. This time it was his turn to threaten to resign, accusing Nehru of a failure to stand up to the British officers commanding the armies of both dominions and who feared that such an intervention would lead to an all-out war. He also clashed with the Prime Minister over his offer to hold a plebiscite in Junagadh, calling it unnecessary and uncalled for. 
No sooner had the Junagadh crisis been resolved after Khan fled to Karachi, a much more serious one erupted in Kashmir, where Maharaja Hari Singh had refused to accede to either India or Pakistan. The differing narratives on the events that unfolded between August and October 1947 pivot around the question of whether Pakistan was behind the tribal invasion of the 22nd of October that forced Hari Singh to accede to India, or whether it was the culmination of a spontaneous outpouring of support by Muslims, mostly from Pakistan's northwest frontier province to help their co-religionists, who they saw as being persecuted by Hindus. For Nehru, there was never any question that his ancestral home belonged to India. But when it came to repelling thousands of tribal militias swarming towards Srinagar, he equivocated. Things came to a head at a defence committee meeting convened on the 26th of October to determine a response to the invasion, where Patel angrily demanded that Nehru declare, declare whether he wanted to keep Kashmir or give it away. When Nehru responded that he wanted Kashmir, Patel turned to Colonel Sam Manekshaw, the head of the Army HQ, and ordered him to send troops to Srinagar. To go into the accession of Kashmir would require a full presentation, uh, particularly on the contentious question of whether an instrument of accession was signed before or after Indian troops landed in Srinagar. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, Instead, I'll leave the final word to Hari Singh's son, uh, Karan Singh, who was forced to admit. It had always seemed to me, on the next slide, please, um, that a man as intelligent as, as my father, and in many ways as constitutional and progressive, should have in those last years so grievously misjudged the political situation in the country. Being a progressive ruler was one thing, coping with a once in millennium historical phenomena was another. When it came to Hyderabad, Patel initially took a hands-off approach, preferring Nehru to deal with the recalcitrant Nizam Osman Ali Khan. But as the crisis dragged on, it was Patel who took the initiative to prepare for a military invasion to put an end to, his, to the state's bid for independence. Once again, Nehru opposed using force to end the crisis. Tensions peaked at a defense committee meeting in September 1948, when Nehru lashed out at Patel, calling him a complete communalist. Patel sat in silence as Nehru continued his harangue and then walked out of the room. The episode so shocked the Sada that he had heart palpitations and had to be put on oxygen. For all the coercion, violence and broken promises, Menon and Patel did achieve their goal of creating a politically cohesive India and of extending responsible democratically elected government to the people of the states. No longer could the ruling princes run their states like fiefdoms. No longer could they remain unaccountable to the people. By the end of 1950, all of the princely unions, with the exception of Kashmir, had adopted the new Indian constitution as their constitution. There is no doubt that integration was a lucrative exercise for the winners. India gained roughly the same territory and population it had lost because of partition and the creation of Pakistan, as well as cash and investments amounting to almost 1 billion rupees, which is 84 billion rupees in today's currency. In return, half of the former rulers were given tax-free privy purse, purses that ranged in value from the 20,000 pounds a year paid to the Maharaja of Mysore to about 40 pounds to the humble Talukdar of Katodia, who worked as a clerk and traveled everywhere on a bicycle to save money. Despite Patel's antipathy towards the princes, he was determined to honor his promises to them by enshrining their privy purses, privileges and dignities in the constitution, declaring this was a small price to pay for the sacrifices they had made. A socialist to the core, Nehru balked at the expenditure of public money on privy purses in perpetuity, while millions of Indians were starving. The arrangement would last only for two decades. Men and women from royal families entered politics, some standing for Congress, eventually to be headed by Nehru's daughter Indira, but most for in opposition parties. Of the 284 princely families that were guaranteed privy purses and privileges at the time of the merger of their states, more than one third would enter politics, either at a federal or state level before the end of 1971. 
With a success rate of more than 80% in the period from 1952 to 1971, princely candidates were eagerly sought after by political parties of almost every shade, including their major critic, the Congress. The greatest concentration of rulers turned politicians was among 17 gunners, such as Jaipur, where Gayatri Devi, the Maharani of Jaipur, would earn a place in the Guinness Book of Records for winning her seat with a 175,000 vote majority in her debut political performance for the centre-right Swatantra Party in 1962. In the 1967 elections, nearly half of the 24 royals who were elected to the Lok Sabha had run against Congress, exacerbating the party's worst performance until then. In state assemblies, the success rate was even higher. It was only a matter of time before Congress sought revenge. For Indira Gandhi, who had been in power for just over a year, there was only one way to avoid an electoral nightmare institute a program of populist measures that would put her opponents in their place. In the case of the princes, that meant the abolition of their priv privileges and privy purses, but getting rid of them would not be easy. The dip dispensations enjoyed by the princes had been guaranteed under Articles 291 and 362 of the Constitution. Obtaining the two-thirds majority needed in the Lok Sabha to change the Constitution would require equal doses of cunning and coercion. Believing that such a move would play well in her populist agenda, agenda sorry, she tried to get a compliant president to de-recognize the princes, only to be stymied by the Supreme Court that ruled it was beyond the president's powers to issue such an order. Undeterred and flushed with a two-thirds parliamentary majority after the 1971 elections, Gandhi successfully introduced a bill into the Lok Sabha to amend the constitution and de-recognize the princes. As far as she was concerned, the time had come to end a system that has no relevance in our society. Had Nehru been alive, he would have applauded the move, but not Patel, who would have viewed her actions as a final betrayal. Last slide, please. Um, in summary, I believe that the princes, while fatally undermined by division and delusions, were let down by the power they trusted the most, namely Great Britain. The rulers' best chance of being able to preserve their kingdoms and coexist with an independent and democratic India was to become more democratic themselves. However, British officials pressed tepidly, if at all, for such reforms, leaving the princes with a false sense of security. Patel and Menon, the architects of integration, took advantage of this false sense of security to lure and arm twist the princes into signing instruments of accession and then broke the promises contained in those instruments in the cause of building a united India. To leave decisions regarding accession and integration to the people of the states, as many rulers demanded, would have unleashed chaos which newly independent India could not afford. While Menon and Patel warned those rulers who dragged their feet on a session that they would face the wrath of their subjects or in, or in extreme cases armed intervention, they never encouraged popular uprisings. Their appeal to the rulers and to their subjects alike was to work in the cause of national unity and stability. In the vast majority of cases, it worked. While there is no doubt that the princes were in this sense betrayed by both the British and India's post-independence leadership, they were their own worst enemies. They never presented a common front or a coherent agenda, and most were too fearful of change to institute rural reforms and prepare themselves for the day their protector, the British Raj, abandoned them. That's the talk. Thank you very much. And apologies again for the uh, technical issues at the beginning of the talk. Um, I hope we've got enough time for some questions. Thank you so much, John. It was really illuminating. And as far as the, the comments on the chat are pretty self-explanatory, amazing, insightful, interesting. I have a few questions, John. How long yep. was this book in the making? And where did you do your primary research? Uh, look, the book was about three years in the making. Um, the the primary research was uh, some it was un, a lot of it. Unfortunately, was interrupted by COVID and not being able to to, to travel to India uh, because of the restrictions there. And um, even if I could have, uh, uh, a lot of the archives were, were closed. 
Um, but I was able to access uh, online um, quite a lot of the uh, National Archives of India material. Um, some of that's also available on demand if you if you order it, which was terrific. Um, the US State Department um, decimal files, uh, another great source um, that I could access through my uh, uh, university library. And um, they're very illuminating because uh, um, th these, these th their records of conversations the US ambassador in Delhi, his consul, uh, and other senior diplomats had with uh, nationalist leaders uh, such as uh, Nehru, Patel, Jin, um, Jinnah, as well as uh, Menon, and, uh, and, and, and quite a few of the princes. So you get quite an interesting perspective. Uh, you know, these, these were, uh, obviously, they were speaking very candidly to, to the diplomats there, uh, uh, not expecting their conversations to be published, you know, <laughs> decades later. But uh, that was a good record. And uh, of course, the uh, um, uh, British Library archives as well um, ha had a wealth of material. So, uh, but, but, but you know, the, the other, the other uh, tremendous um, source is uh, the 12 volume transfer of power uh, that came out, I think, in 1971 that Nicholas Mansuray uh, edited. Uh, it, it, it's 12 volumes, each volume about a thousand pages, and it contains uh, cables, uh, communications, uh, reports. Um, uh, going backwards and forwards between London and Delhi, um, uh, Mount Batten's personal reports, um, uh, his conversations with Men and Patel, uh, Hamidullah Khan, other leaders as well. So uh, on the princely state, so it's it's really um, you know there, there is a lot of material that one can sift through. Certainly, is there any authentic material from the prince's side? I mean, it's their their side of the story. Well. Um, yeah, th there is. Um, in, in, again, in the National Archives of India, um, uh, you know, you, you know. Well, you, you get. Uh, let, let, let's, let's just take. I mean, uh, this is one minor example, but it's a good example. That that, that state I mentioned, the Muslim state of Radhampur, which is in uh, 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 Katiawa. Um, it's a, it was an eleven-gun salute state. Most. Indians have probably never heard of it. Uh, it's it's the, the town of Ranampur is still there, and I think the royal family still resides in the palace. But um, you know, the the uh, so there was a lot of you know it, it was one of the states that didn't accede on the fifth by the fifteenth of August, and uh, uh, it, and earlier it had actually um, teamed up with several other Katiawa states and uh, sent a joint petition to uh, Jinnah saying. Uh, you know, uh, we'll form a federation, we'll, we'll, we'll accede to Pakistan, but Jinnah and uh, the Pakistani uh, uh, arm of the State Department uh, kind of ignored the request. I think they had their eyes on uh, Jodhpur and, and Junagad and the bigger fish rather than these small, rather mm. smaller states. But so so you, you can see the, the you know, the, the correspondence is there um, from, uh, you know, the Radhampur Dadabar. Um, you know, and even the excuses for not signing the instrument of accession in time, which included things like uh, the Maharaja has got a bad case of bronchitis and can't come to Delhi, or the monsoon rains have disrupted transport and communication. So there, there is, there are these things. It, it is, um, and, and of course, you know, the the the, the opinions uh, of the rulers are there uh, in uh, you know the transfer of power volumes, uh, what they thought about uh, accession and in, in integration um, uh, in, in their conversations with uh, uh, Mountbatten and, and other senior officials. So there's quite a bit um, okay. there. Did, did all the princes receive a privy purse? I thought I heard you mention 260 something. 200, yeah, 268, I think. Um, so yeah, why it, were the others deprived of it? Oh look, it, it's it's a complicated question. Main, mainly, um, ma mainly size-wise. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there were 149 gun salute states. They all got privy purses and 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 were able to enjoy these privileges. And then there was more a sort of a a, a pecking order bit below them. Um, um, so the I, I, it might have reflected the composition of the Chamber of Princes as well, which uh, uh, didn't represent all the states. And there were. Okay. Um, um, you know, some of the states were rep were Got it. represented by other states, a group like that. So, of the five sixty two, how many acceded to? Uh, how many opted for Pakistan? As a question from Sandhya Mehta. Um, well, look, I mean, as I said, there was there was a bunch of um, uh, Katiawa states that wanted to opt for Pakistan, but their requests were kind of you know pretty much 
sidelined. Um, uh, if, if, you know, um, um, Bhopal was another state that was flirting with um, uh, opting for Pakistan, uh, um, which which sounds kind of crazy, I mean, and, and um, because uh, you know you, you you know how how could you have a state like Bhopal possibly accede to Pakistan? Well, um, you know the argument is how could you have uh, East Bengal? East Bengal also be part of Pakistan. I mean, the distance between the eastern and western wings is even greater. So you potentially, you know, there's nothing really to stop a state like Bhopal um, acceding to Pakistan, even though geographically there would be no connection. Um, Junagadh was, of course, the, the one that um, um, most, uh, comes to mind uh, uh, firstly. And, and what's interesting is that um, it did you know, it, it's Maharaja did sign an instrument of accession to join Pakistan. And um, as far as Pakistan is concerned, that instrument has never been revoked. And if you look at a map, a modern official map of Pakistan now, it still shows Junagad as being part of Pakistan. Commander Mohan Narayan wants to know whether it was the ego of Sir C.P. Ramaswamy that initially led Travancore to refuse <laughs> to join. He had a big ego. Um, he wasn't very popular. Uh, among the people of his state, I, I think there was a lot of ego involved in, in that, certainly. Um, but but look, I mean, Travancore itself was was uh, you know it, it was a potential candidate. Uh, you know, it, it was a seaboard state. It was uh, uh, very rich in mineral resources. It was uh, uh, you know one of the most literate states in India. I mean, it, it potentially you know it it could have uh, um, possibly gone it alone and been economically viable. Um, yeah, but certainly I, I think uh, Ramaswamy Iyer's uh, ego had a lot to do with it. But but also, I mean, it wasn't just him; it was the Maharaja as well. And um, so there there was uh, you know both, the, but you know, there was certainly a a a, a um, kind of there, yep. there, there, there there was it it didn't have the support of, of the population certainly, but. Um, you know, it was uh, it, it was um, you know certainly being uh, a popular notion in the halls of the Travancore Dorbar. Commander's next question moves us from the south to the west. He wants mm -hmm. to know what was Shanawas Bhutto's role in Junagadh wanting to accede to Pakistan. Uh, um, yeah, well, you know, interesting. Um, you know, his. Um, his role was what was 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 a, was a crucial one. I mean, he um, had kind of uh, elbowed his way into uh, uh, the state uh, uh, prior to um, independence, and and uh, and and was uh, crucial in convincing uh, Mahabat Khan that uh, he should accede to to Pakistan. Um, so yes, so he played a very important role there. And his last question is his last question is about Hyderabad. Uh, mm. With uh, Operation Polo, was there any choice with the Razakars running riot in Hyderabad? Patel did not really have a choice, is his view, and it, he feels it's strange that Nehru should oppose the use of force. N Nehru was a pacifist. He he was opposing the use of force in Kashmir. He was opposing the use of force in Junagadh. He was certainly opposing, you know. I mean, you know, as a last resort, yes. But you know, uh, and 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 finally, you know, he, you know, of course, you know, he 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 um, you know, he 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 didn't, you know, he didn't stop the uh, police action from from happening. Um, but um, what was was there an alternative? Pro probably not. I, I don't see, but um, could it have been done differently? Possibly, yes. I mean, the, could there have been uh, uh, you know, more bloodshed averted? I, I'd say so. I mean, the, the Razakars were poorly armed, badly trained, um, that there'd been an Australian gun runner who'd been flying uh, arms and ammunition from Karachi to Hyderabad. None of that stuff was, was ever used. Um, um, so if it, you know, the, the Indian army, uh, I think went in, um, um, perhaps a little bit too, uh, 
uh, too, too many guns blazing uh, because you know ultimately you had uh, that the loss of life was was of the order of at least twenty five thousand people, and the aftermath of that uh, police action was also uh, you know horrendous. Um, mm -hmm. uh, persecution of Muslims in that state went on for for many years um, afterwards, and uh, uh, so there, there could have been a um, it could have it, it could have been maybe done in more um in in a less sort of what's the word for it um mm. yeah yeah um most of us are only aware of the use of force in junagadh and hyderabad and and kashmir you did mention there were some other teeny tiny states where there was use of force which were those john there were, there were threats of force rather okay. than use of force. So a lot of the, in, in the case of some of the Orissa and Chhattisgarh states, there was certainly, um, you know, the, the, those rulers who, um, you know, didn't want to sign on the dotted line. Uh, this was to um, integrate their states into neighboring provinces of either Orissa or Chhattisgarh or, or, or for me, and that they, they, were, they were threatened with the use of force. Um, but no, and, and even in Junagadh as well, I mean, Indian troops massed on the state's borders and crossed the borders, but there was no resistance. So uh, uh, they expected, uh, you know, to, to find um, a reasonably well-armed uh, Junagadh state force, but in fact, there was, they, they were very poorly armed and, 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 and could offer uh, no We move back to Kashmir. Ganesh mm. wants to know that with the abrogation of Article 370 being heard in the Supreme Court, would mm. you have an opinion as to whether Kashmir should be treated any differently from the other princely <laughs> states? He's really <laughs> brought us into the present now. <laughs> into the present. <laughs> uh, I, I personally think there is. Um, but, you know, I'd rather be, you know, um, um, you know stick, stick to the past. I mean, it was a promise made at the time of of independence and um, and um, you know the, the instrument of accession that um, Kashmir signed did stipulate that there wouldn't be you know uh, um, interference in its in, in its internal affairs, i.e., it could keep its institution, it could keep you know fly its flag et cetera, and so on, and uh, and just the nature, very nature of Kashmir. Um, the the makeup of it uh, being the only Muslim majority state in India, I think, uh, requires special dispensation. And uh, Article three seventy, I think, while not perfect, um, certainly has has. Uh, has Saranjot Singh wants to know what was the view of the socialist elements of society regarding the status of the princely state. Well, I mean, I think you there again. It's um, uh, uh, I think Nehru. Nehru um, uh, exemplifies that attitude uh, that there was very little, there was no sympathy among socialists uh, uh, prior to or after independence, very little sympathy for the states. I mean, um, you know, among some of the freedom fighters, certainly there was uh, Vir Savakar, for instance, uh, he, he was, he came out in support of Travancore's um, uh, bid for independence, but you, know, you can call him a socialist. But it just goes to show that there was a division of opinion among uh, nationalists and, and freedom fighters, and and I think you've also got to remember that there were, I mean, even even Mahatma Gandhi um, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, thought that like, you know, was 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 it was was an admirer of Mysore's Maharaja uh, Krishna Wad, uh, um, Wadia. Krishna Raja Wadia. Um, and uh, you know, uh, described uh, Mysore state as a Raj Raya as a sort of a almost like a perfect kingdom. So you know, there, there were definitely rulers who were enlightened, who were progressive, uh, who championed, um, you know, who even supported the nationalist cause, who funded um, Congress as well. Um, uh, so you know, it's 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 a complex question, but. But you know, if if you if you take Nehru's views and 
and if you accept that Nehru was a socialist and represented, you know, the, the socialist wing of the nationalist movement, then there wasn't much sympathy uh, or support for uh, the states. But at the same time, there, you know, there, there was there were also divisions in, in within Congress uh, as to how to approach, how to deal with the problem of the states and the, and. And basically, Congress, throughout most of uh, the pre-independence period, decided it would best to take a hands-off approach. Um, Naveen wants to know if there were any princely states which acceded in a spirit of nationalism. I mean, without force. I'm oh, sure there yeah, must have yeah. been many, many of them, right? Oh, there right. were. There were. There was uh, uh, a dozen that joined the, the Constituent Assembly uh, in about... Um, uh, well, that was April, and uh, there were states like Rewa, Gwali, or um, uh, Baroda, uh, Jaipur, and so on. So there were, yeah, there were there were significant numbers of of uh, important states that did. Okram yeah. wants you to weave a scenario. What would have been the situation like if Nehru and Pandit, had, uh, I, I'm sorry, if, if Nehru and Patel had shown a united front? Um, look. I don't think it would have made a lot of uh, look. I mean, I mean, Nehru um, was, as, as I mentioned early on, he was he was very virulent in his uh, op, you know dislike of the states, you know, calling them these sinks of debauchery and and being despotic and so on. He had he had very he had no sympathy for the states or, or their rulers. Um, you know, e even in uh, was it April 1947, um, um, uh, declaring that any state that refused to um, accede to India would be treated as hostile. Now that was a threat that you know turned a lot of you know it shook a lot of princes. They they you know they saw that as as sure sign that their that uh, you know a, a future Congress ruled India would not uh, have any sympathy for them at all. Um, so, but, but, you know, Patel was put in charge of the State's Department and VP Menon was his deputy. So once that happened, it was pretty much uh, that they, it was that team that um, ran negotiations with the States. And um, I mean, that's, that's you know, Nehru more or less took a hands-off approach from that point onwards. He had enough problems on his mind uh on, on you know rather than have to um you know worry about the states um so hmm. what they don't teach in our schools is about which states acceded to our neighbors i mean i know only of babalpur are there any others nilufar wants to know Oh well, yeah, we got to read the book. There's a whole chapter on the Pakistan states. So there was mm -hmm. Kharagpur, Bawalpur, um, Kalat, of course, which um, which comprises um, present-day Baluchistan, a smattering of smaller states like Deer, Arm, um, Swat, uh, in, in Swat, and so on. Yeah, so there were ten states um, that found themselves on the Pakistan side of the partition line. And did Pakistan offer any privy purses or? Uh, it did too, yes, yes, it did. Yeah. And, Very, uh, and, and they were revoked a when? year after India abolished its privy purses, so in 1972. Okay. So that answers Naveen's question. Okay. How did the integration of princely states impact regional dynamics and cultural diversity within India? Wow, <laughs> that's almost a book. I think uh, we would like you to talk separately at a separate talk about that because it's such a vast topic. Oh, it's a vast topic. You know, it's um, it, it's an interesting one. I mean, you know, you yeah, you can't look at the princely states as a whole. Um, there's no one size fits all. I mean, the Rajput states, you know, were you know they they could trace their lineages back much further than you know some of the. Um, you know the, the central Indian states, for instance, uh, and and you and you could look at them in, in, in separately. The, the the Sikh ruled states certainly, um, you know, uh, um, need to be treated on their own. And in fact, you know, as I point out in in the book, I mean, the, the, there was a lot of antipathy towards Congress from among the Sikhs and the Rajputs, and there was talk among them of. Um, 
you know, forming federations or, you know, or hedging their bets as to which uh, dominion they might join. And the Jat ruled states, Awa and Bharatpur, uh, you know, you, you, should, you should look at them in, in, uh, together as well. And then you've got southern states such as Cochin and Travancore. Um, you know, yeah, it, it's a good question. It's, it's, it's something that um, I think, I think you, you, you'll get a, set, a feel for it in the book, but it's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a big topic to, <laughs> to cover. Um, and the last question, we don't hear much about the northeastern states, Manipur, etc. Yeah. Were, were they difficult uh, to convince to accede? Uh, no, look, it, it's, I must admit, I probably should have spent a little bit more time um, talking about them. I do mention them, but only briefly, and that's more in the context of, of Nehru um, writing to them. I mean, he, 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 he did, you know, he, 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 he did. He, he was um, roped in, if you like, to to this, you know, to this whole, to this in, into uh, convincing them to accede to India, and that was mainly in the threat of reminding states like Manipur that, uh, you know, if you decide to go it alone, there's no one is going to come to your assistance, and you know, being so geographically separate from the rest of, from, from the main uh, part of India, they they certainly would have been. Find it, found it hard to <laughs> to to do that, but but, but Manipur is an interesting case. But it's 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 very much a topic for a, another compass. Uh, another. Did you study Sikkim at all, or was that a totally different kettle of fish? Totally different kettle of fish. Sikkim, Nepal. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. No, I don't mention Sikkim. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for your time. This was most illuminating. We know it's pretty yeah, late, right. and for uh, for the benefit of our. Listeners, John is speaking to us from Australia, where it's way, way past his bedtime. Oh, no, no, no. It's all right. It's fine. Yeah, no. Thank you, Kaki, for organizing the talk. And um, please buy the book. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Have a nice weekend.